This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, everybody, to the one-on-one podcast. Here with me today, Michigan running back, senior Karan Higdon, three-year letterman, named the team's 2017 Offensive Player of the Year, All-Big Ten honoree, has played in 28 contests with seven starts at running back. Career stats, he has carried the ball 247 times, rushed for 1,438 yards, has scored 17 touchdowns, and he has a total of 2,000 432 all-purpose yards. Karan, welcome to the studio. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. To kick this off, the funny thing is sometimes it is really a small world. I was just getting my hair styled after a long day of work, and I was just having a conversation, and all of a sudden, someone that you knew was like, oh, yeah, I know Karan Higdon. And I'm like, really? And I had you know struck up a conversation and said, hey, you know what? There's an opportunity that I do a podcast, and I'm just fascinated. How did you hear about this interview? Right, right, right. So they told me about the interview and that they uh, gave you gave you my number. Um, so once you know that transpired and you reached out to me, I was like, "Let's do it." Yeah, exactly. And so, what do you think so far? When you walked in, I could see that you're excited to get this done, to have a conversation with someone talking Michigan ball and talking about you and your path so far uh, in your career at Michigan. Yeah, I was super stoked. You know, walking in here, you know, it's completely different from what I expected. Uh, I see, you know, WWE belts all around. You know, a lot of newspapers, a lot of sponsorship forms and everything, man. This is awesome, man. Great setup. Thank you so much. So to get started, we're now here early May. People are kind of wondering what is going on in your preparation ahead of an important season for you guys on the Wolverines. Right. Right now we're in the off season. So really just recuperating our body, rehabbing and making sure we take time off, um, but not too much time. Still getting in some individual work, but we're not working out as a team until another two weeks. Part of what takes place in the off season is recuperating. And so what does that mean? How many workouts per week are you getting in ahead of the season? Yeah, you're still working out um, pretty much on your own schedule, but you're not going as hard as you would during a, during a regular workout season. You want to make sure that your body's able to rehab, you know, the nicks and bruises that you obtain during the season. You want to make sure that you're able to recuperate from those um, and really just give your body a, a rest, give your mind a rest, you know, based off the season. Take us through how you evaluated your junior season. You broke out, man. Everybody that saw you said, oh, my gosh, Karan really helped that offense, especially in a time when it was struggling a little bit inconsistent with some injuries. But it seemed like with your contributions, you were a great spark for that 2017 team. Can you take us through a little bit your season? And, uh, you know, you kind of broke out now, and people have some major expectations for you this year. Right, right, right. No, I I, I like it. You know, I like the expectations. Uh, Last year was definitely a great year, and I expect to have an even better one, you know, um, this upcoming year. Um, it was definitely a good start for me, you know, a push off of, you know, what I've done my sophomore year, my freshman year, and really just to get my name out there and show, you know, the world what I can do as a as a ball player. Um, I, I feel like I prepared very well. The coaches put me in a great situation, you know, and I really just trusted the process, process stayed true to the course. When my name was called, I showed up. Yeah, and along with teammate Chris Evans, you became the first pair of teammates to share a weekly conference award. You guys were the co-Big Ten Offensive Players of the Week, and it's the first time it's happened where you guys both were at the the same position. Yeah, that was awesome, man. Yeah, what's your relationship been like now with Chris? Because people are saying, you know what, with the combination of Chris and Karan this year, you guys can do some things seriously with some improvement in the offensive line. Yeah, me and Chris are definitely, definitely close. You know, we work together, we compete against each other, we push each other, we motivate each other, and we we hold each other to a high standard and high expectation. So, you know, having someone like Chris, you know, amongst my side and being able to push me and stay in my ear each and every day when things get tough, you know, it does wonders for, for both of us. And now we're definitely going to talk about the big 2018 season. A lot of people are excited, and it's a kind of a pivotal year as well because of the expectations, and you're kicking off the season with a big-time, prime-time matchup. People definitely are excited to talk about it. But I want to go back and kind of learn a little bit about where did you develop the love of football? Who were your influences? Who put the first ball in your hand? Yeah, really, it just stemmed from my environment, my neighborhood. You know, I grew up in Sarasota, Florida. And uh, football was big there. You know, that was sort of like our way out, you know, for the kids that were growing up in the, in the area. So every single day we were playing pickup football out on the street, you know, stop sign to stop sign. And I got my first football from my uncle. Um, it was like a huge NFL football, neon lights and stuff. It was pretty cool, pretty dope. 
So every day we would use that football and play against the older kids, you know, pickup games. From there, I started playing youth league. My mom put me in uh, the Ringland Redskins. I quit my first day. What happened? I, it was too hot. <laughs> <laughs> it was way too hot. And, uh, you know, when you're playing in the streets, you can go inside at any time. But when it's organized sports, you know, you got to condition. You got to practice. You know, you got to be out there for a certain number of hours. And I wasn't feeling that at first. And you know? so who did you have to tell? Did you tell your mom, your, your family, like, okay, I'm not doing this? Oh, yeah. No, most definitely. I quit <laughs> and walked off the field. <laughs> <laughs> I went home. And uh, my mom, you know, she made me go back out there the next day. And ever since then, you know, I've, I've had a love for the game. And so who were your teams growing up? Uh, were you more of a college guy that you liked to watch when you were uh, watching uh, football? Or did you definitely... Did you take stock into watching the NFL game? I was more in the NFL. I didn't really care for college. I didn't really see college in, in my future. You know, I felt like, you know, I was going to go straight from high school to the NFL. At that time, you know, growing up, that was that was a thing, you know. With that, you know, I liked a couple different teams. I really didn't like teams specifically. I liked more of the players. You know, so Adrian Peterson, LaDainian Thomason, those type of guys. I would watch them and, you know, aspire to be like them, watch them before my football games and try and, duplicate what they do so even as a youngster your eye was to be a running back you wanted the ball you wanted to carry the rock I wanted that ball in my hands why I just like the feeling you know I like the feeling of having the team on my back being able to make plays big plays you know being able to step into a large role and fulfill that duty I, I like that as a youngster around here you know some legends played uh, the position of running back. So we all got a chance to see Barry Sanders make some big plays yeah. and score some touchdowns. So a lot of people here definitely value the <laughs> running back position. Exactly. Good. So as you got older, as you decide, okay, I'm going to stick with it, even if it's hot, I'm going to stick <laughs> with it. I'm going to grow and continue. Uh, take us through then uh, how you got to college and how you got to the University of Michigan. Yeah, really just, you know, my mom, she did a great job of instilling a mindset that, you know, I got to compete. You know, at the end of the day, no matter who's out there, who's watching, who's, who am I going against, I have to compete. And I always got to look at what the next man's doing and not only try to outdo them, but incorporate things that maybe they have an advantage of me or uh, over me and, and put that in my game. So doing that, you know, at a young age, I was able to incorporate those things, try those things without pra I mean, throughout practice. And um, I was able to develop a lot of skill sets. And with that, I just kept working with it. You know, I had some great coaches behind me, you know, to motivate me you know, tweak things here and there, um, and really just my drive, you know, the support of my mom and my family, you know, just pushed me through. Yeah, what was it like to get recruited? Because uh, not a lot of people have, you know, universities coming for them and asking, hey, tell us a little bit, visiting maybe multiple universities. Did you, by chance as well, put together a highlight reel or any hype videos or anything like that to get your name across or take us through yeah. what it was like from the time you finished high school to the time you got to Michigan and decided that that was the place? Yeah, man, no, it was crazy. You know, my freshman year of high school, I walked in, you know, um, and the coaches had huge expectations for me. And I ended up having a great season my freshman year of varsity. And uh, I got my first offer from the University of Tennessee. So when that happened... As a freshman. Know, as a freshman. So once that happened, everything became such a reality for me. Like, wow, like, you know, I'm about to become this elite ball player. I can do this. You know, I can really achieve my goals and my dreams. And uh, so as I continued to push through that and have that in the back of my mindset, you know, it, it motivated me to be the best, not only in my area, but in the, in the state, in the country, in the world. You know, I wanted to be the best. So I, I worked that way, and offers just continued to roll in and roll in and roll in. And uh, it was a fun process until I had to decide where I wanted to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and once you got to make a decision, when you got a handful of offers, it can often become stressful and difficult, you know, because you got to narrow it down, and you're making a decision you really can't veer away from. I was never the type to transfer from a school or follow the bandwagon. So I had to make a decision that I was able to live with, deal with, no matter what the circumstances were. So to reset, you said that as a freshman, you started to realize, okay, I can play the position of running back, and you got your first letter from Tennessee, and that letter kind of signified to you, you know what, there's interest. This is real. This yeah. is something that can really realistically take place. And so when you're 14, 15, and so you could honestly say that that letter was a spark for you that kept you hungry, that said, that told you, you know what, I can really do this. Sometimes yeah. uh, that's all it maybe took was to see that, you know what, there's someone actually looking at what I'm doing. Yeah, well, it wasn't even a letter. Coach uh, Rob Gillespie came down, the running backs coach, came down and offered me right then and there. Mm. You know, like, you have an offer from the University of Tennessee. Oh, wow. And it was like, what? You know, as a freshman, I'm just coming out the weight room, and th for, that's what he told me. And, uh, you know, so they show, showed heavy interest. Um, and then after that, Kentucky came in, and 
from there, everything just started rolling. It seemed like every single day a different coach was in the office waiting for me. Typically, at that time, they want to know kind of a little bit uh, what you're about, how yeah. hungry are you in terms of your desire to play football. They obviously know your stats and things like that. What was it like to talk to these uh, college coaches? Were they appropriate with you? Were they fair? Do you feel like, okay, you know what? I kind of got a sense of who was maybe a little bit more real with you and who was a little yeah. bit more like kind of business-like, maybe a little bit more aloof? Yeah, no, most definitely. You see a lot of different personalities and you see you know, the flip side of a lot of things. You see some yeah. guys, like you said, that are very straight up. You can see some guys that are salesmen, so they're trying to sell you. And then you see some guys who are just really waiting for you to make a move. So as a as a youngster, you know, I felt like my environment kind of did a great job of preparing me for those type of situations and, you know, it's common sense, you know, declarations. And I was able to handle it pretty well, especially with the assistant of uh, my coaches. So it was a, it was a smooth process as far as dealing with the coaches and communicating with them, and, you know, a lot of them see me as a likable guy, so it was fairly easy to get along with a lot of them. Everyone wants to know that's listening, what was it like being recruited by the University of Michigan? I was actually committed to the University of Iowa at the time, and Harbaugh called me when I was at work, and uh, he offered me on the phone. He told me, you know, he's, I'm definitely a guy he wants on his team, and, you know, that whole spiel, and I frankly told him no. You know, like I said, commitment was very big for me. Transferring wasn't in my options. So I already had my mind set up. It was like three days before a signing day. So there was no way in my mind I saw me flipping to the University of Michigan. And uh, he, long story short, he got a hold of my parents and they set up a visit behind my back. I didn't know about it until I got home. And that's thing, you know, I'm on the way to the airport. And, uh, you know, once I visited the school, I was just like, geez, you know, it's a whole different world. You know, not only do I have top academics, but I got top top-level football, you know, the best of the both worlds, you know, a historical, traditional school and football. You don't get no better than that. Yeah, I definitely want to tap into that. So you had told us that you kind of had a decision-making process in place, yeah. and the first go-around, it kind of equated to you going to Iowa. Right. What was the things and what were the, you know, evaluations that you made that said at first Iowa was the place? Yeah, the, 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 the coaching staff there, the people there, you know, the environment there was just very genuine, and that's that's something I love. I felt like you know, I can trust him in my life. You know, I developed a great relationship with, you know, Coach White, who was a running backs coach, um, Coach Ferentz. You know, those are all great people, you know, and, uh, you know, that was definitely one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make, you know, in my life. Um, the school, you know, I thought it was, it was for me. The environment, I thought it fit me perfect. I love the style of offense that they ran, very similar to Harbaugh, you know, smash mouth football. You know, they also had a great traditional um, asset with their football team. They were building, you know, a new hospital. Um, and that was very, you know, important to me because I want to get into the medical field. And so they were already in place of trying to have internships set up, you know, once I enrolled and everything. So it was like, you know, it was a done deal, you know, and like I said, we built a, a lengthy relationship, but it came to a point where I had to make a decision, not only best for myself, but for my daughter. And, uh, it was Michigan, you know, I had to leave a legacy, you know, I knew academically, you know, there was nothing better than that in the world. And as as well as football, you know, I'm playing for one of the greatest coaches of all time. So it's kind of like, do you take this lottery ticket or do you play with a scratch off? Mm. And so you look at it and you say, even though we all got our thoughts about what's best for us, you, you kind of notice now it even always goes back to the family and it goes back to how important they are. They Look, you told us they set it up behind your back. Right. You know what? And they kind of knew maybe potentially that, you know what? Iowa would probably would have been great. Yeah. But at the same time, when you hear about the University of Michigan and Coach Harbaugh, that kind of tells you, you know what? Let me even challenge myself to go to an elite program. Exactly. Let me see where I stack up and, and let me, exactly like you said, maybe even cash in a winning ticket not just settle, let me go and push myself. And exactly. so it kind of came across to you when you visited that the University of Michigan was elite. Exactly. It, it was an elite school. It is an elite school. You know, it has the credentials, the statistics to prove so. So it was like, hey, this is what you got to do. You know, so Coach Harbaugh said it best. You know, it was like easy decision, tough phone call. Mm. And, and he was so right. Easy decision, tough phone call. Yeah. So everyone wants to know because now you're in there day to day. And we got a little glimpse yeah. with the all-in feature. And I look forward to talking to you about filming that and what that was like and what that's been like since as you're around town, the east side, in Ann Arbor and things like that. <laughs> I want to know what's it been like, the reaction, because in the end, television's huge. Right. It's, a big, it's, it's a big platform and things like that. But many people want to know because we got a glimpse of the way that Jim Harbaugh talks to the team and the way he uses metaphors and the passion in which he speaks to kind of get across, look, this is more than just playing on the field. It's about respect, 
discipline, doing the best you can as a team. You've seen his dad kind of come in and rile everybody up. Right. And you've seen uh, Don Brown came away as the star <laughs> of the show and the way he kind of came across. But playing for Coach Harbaugh, a man that obviously has his hand in that offense, what's it been like and how can you describe playing for a coach like Jim Harbaugh? Yeah, it's different. You know, it's challenging. You know, day in and day out, he treats it like a business. And, and it's all with the mindset to prepare you for when you get to that next level. Because regardless of what position you play on the team, where you stand at, you're going to have an opportunity to go to the next level if you want it. Because at our pro day, all 32 teams are there. And he, he wants to make sure that he's developing you and putting you in a situation where you've seen this before. You've seen this story before. So he coaches you to a level, you know, more than what you may get at a different school. He pushes you to a level and brings an intensity more than what you get may get at another school or at another level. You know, a lot of guys I talk to that are in the league now that play with me when they were at the university, they're like, the league is easy. You know, I've seen this story before. And and in fact, it's easier than what I've seen and what I went through because I've been pushed, you know, to the ultimate level. And that's what he does. He He pushes you. He pushes you to the ledge right before you fall off. And then he grabs you, you know, and then once you get to the end of the process, it all makes sense. It all adds up. When you're going through it, you don't understand it. You're like, man, this guy's crazy. He's a lunatic. What is wrong with him? But then once you get to a situation where you're facing what he's trying to prepare you for, you understand exactly what he was doing all along. The good thing is, is it sounds like the players buy in. They see the reason for the message. And that's what, as a psychologist myself, that's the whole key is to make people believe and to make people understand that, look, the path might be difficult. Not everything that's going to be said may be nice right. and may not be delivered sugar-coated. But if you believe that, hey, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to try my absolute best to get the most out of you, the method in the end is, is irregardless. Exactly. It's just, hey, work hard, do what you got to do. If you believe and follow, there's an opportunity for success. Right. And now you've seen it because your third year, 2017, you blew up and you've done some things. Exactly. Okay, so people want to know now. You get on campus. It's uh, your freshman year, 2015. What were your goals early on, early camps, getting into that offense and seeing what's this about? College ball, big time, big 10, national, uh, national stuff here where you're not just playing, you know, in front of a few people where every move in terms of the Michigan program is looked at significantly. What was it like your freshman year uh, early on? Yeah, no, I wanted to, when I got there, I wanted to put my city on the map. You know, I wanted to put everybody yep. that, you know, has been a part of my process and everybody that looks up to me and, you know, is expecting me to do big things. I wanted to show them, you know, what I was about and that I could do it. You know, everybody who may have doubted me, I wanted to show them that I could do it. I wanted to play as a true freshman. I wanted to start. Um, and, you know, I had I had some adversity throughout my freshman year, hit some walls and had some bumps and bruises, but I was able to prevail through that and still accomplish some of my goals. You know, I was able to play as a true freshman and put my name on the map. You made your first appearance October 10th, Northwestern, first career appearance. You carried the ball eight times for 16 yards. Take us through that first game. You're trying your absolute best. You want to show the coaches. You want to put good film on there. So they say, we got, we got to get Karan in there. We got right. to put it, put the ball in his hands. So you finally break through October 10th. What was that like? And it was incredible. I remember my first play. You know, I was back there shaking like crazy, nervous, you know, seeing that there were, you know, 100,000 people. 100,000 eyes on me just in the stadium alone, you know, hearing it, you know, feeling the atmosphere, seeing the other team, the opposing team, you know, looking me down, staring me down, waiting to tackle me. You know, it, it was an amazing adrenaline rush. And I was just so excited, you know, to be out there on the field and be out there, you know, on television playing for the University of Michigan, you know. That made me feel great. So with that, it just was like I got to take it play by play. You know, I'm on the field. That was step one. I got on the field, and now it's time for step two. Now i got to make something happen now that I'm on the field. And then the next week, was that the game, October uh, 17th, Michigan State? Was that the infamous game that everybody remembers now in the early rivalry where it was, was the trouble? That was the game. Was okay, the so game. you were there. You were present. You recorded a couple carries. What was it like being on the sideline? Because if everyone remembers that game, Michigan, for the most part, had done enough to win the game. They were it in did. control. They stopped Michigan State. They did everything that, in terms of the game plan that everybody remembers, they did. Wait. And then it just came down to the trouble with the snap. What was it like being in the, your first Michigan? Michigan State game because that's a big taste for an athlete to see. Whoa, this is not just a game versus Northwestern. This is Michigan State, their biggest rival. It's yeah. a big week. Everybody's talking about everything. They're going down top to bottom the roster, and you played a decent game. The team, yeah. the team did enough to win, and it came down to one big play. What was that like being on the field that day? It, it was nerve wracking, you know, playing in that game. You know, I 
I never, I didn't grow up as a Michigan fan, so I didn't understand the context of Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, and Michigan. I didn't understand it. And as I was going through the university and going through my freshman year, I started to learn more and more about it. Even to this day, I'm still learning more and more about it. But I still didn't understand the context of it during that game until I was there and I was playing in it. And I seen the look on the other team's eyes and the look on our, our guys' eyes. And on TV, I've seen, you know, plays that were botched and where it was like the freakiest things happen, you know, in the final seconds of a game. And I did not think my freshman year I'd be a part of an experience like that. So when that happened, my mind just went blank. I was like, what is going on? And when I seen it happen, I was just shocked. It's like one of those things that people talk about, kind of like everything slows down and then your mind starts to process it like you're going into shock. Like, dude, Jalen Watts Jackson has actually got the ball. Okay, fine. We can maybe still tackle him. Boom. Now he's got the ball and he's picking it up and running it. Oh, no. Stop him. Stop him. And then he actually crosses and then you recognize cognitively that, oh, my gosh, we lost this game. Right. right. Was it like a shock experience? It was a complete shock. You know, I heard the stadium so loud and rowdy in a split second become absolutely silent. And it was just like, what just happened? What what just happened? This is unreal, you know? And that was something else, sort of like a wake-up call for me, you know, that, hey, this college game is crazy, and it's not over until the, 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 the clock hit zero. It's not over until the clock hit zero. What was it like in the locker room in the week after uh, trying to get to the next game? Because it's a big blow, because it's a big rivalry game. You hear about it, and unfortunately... That play to this day is replayed now when we talk Michigan, Michigan State. It's a big time play <laughs> in is. the annals of uh, time in terms of what that play represents. It's not going away. It's just a game, you know, that unfortunately did not go your guys' way. What was it like just trying to get through the next seven days? It was tough, man. Yeah. You know, guys were upset, you know, coaches were upset. But at the end of the day, we all knew we had to get back to the drawing board and prepare mm-hmm. for that following week. With that, we, you know, we, we decided we wanted to take it out on our next opponent. Exactly. Take it out on the next opponent and get to the next thing. And that's, I think, what's important for a football team, and that's the importance of coaching, too, right. is to just put stuff, uh, bad stuff behind you and on to the next goal and objective, right? Exactly. And that's what your coaches do for you guys, and you can tell week to week. Now, can you tell us a little bit what's it like, the big adjustment from your first year to becoming a sophomore in terms of now you kind of know the lay of land a little bit, you have an off season to prepare, you're in the gym doing your business. How did you feel growing as a sophomore as compared to a freshman? Yeah, you know, as a freshman, your goal is to get on the field. At mm-hmm. least my goal was. Mm-hmm. My goal was to get on the field. My goal was to travel to every game. Mm-hmm. And then from there, you know, going into my sophomore year, you know, it's confidence. You have more confidence because now you understand what college ball is about. You understand the playbook. You understand the goals. You may not have it completely, but you at least understand it and comprehend it. So for me, it wasn't about worrying about if I'm going to get on the field or not. Mm. It was about making something happen on the field because now I, I know and I understand. And all the mistakes that I had during my freshman year, I didn't want to make them again my sophomore year. And I felt like I did that. You know, my sophomore year, I, had a, I was on track to have a, a really decent year. You know, I had, was pulled back a little bit. You know, because, you know, obviously we had a senior who was getting ready to departure and they wanted to prepare him for, you know, the next level. We had Chris, you know, I was coming off an injury. We had Ty. So, in a sense, I was a little held back. Um, But I was still able to break away with that confidence and have a season that, you know, I needed to have for myself to build that confidence and to continue to build off of that leading into my junior year. Okay, now we'll definitely talk about your junior year. But everyone kind of is excited when they saw that Amazon was going to film. And for all of us to get a little bit of some insight into kind of what's it like to, you know, be coached by Harbaugh, game to game, what it was like. Tell us a little bit about All In. And you were actually featured prominently, your family and hometown and things like that. We got a chance to see just a little bit of a yeah. glimpse of your family. What was it like being part of All In on Amazon? It, it was cool. You know, you knew they were there. But for me, you really weren't paying attention. And a lot of guys weren't paying attention because... At the end of the day, we had a big goal at the end of the season. We wanted to be national champions. It didn't work out that way, but that was our goal. So that's essentially what everybody was focused on. It was cool having them around, you know, being able to develop relationships, you know, with the crew um, and being able to have cameras around and just see what that atmosphere is like. You know, it was definitely a cool experience, and they got a lot of stuff on film. They didn't release a lot of things, you know, um, but it, it was still a really cool thing to see and watch and I was happy that they were able to provide the the fans at least something to look after. 
And what's been the reaction of the university and the squad that were part of it? Do you guys feel like, okay, yeah, Michigan had a hand in it. It came out well. I mean, literally, Don Brown became a superstar overnight yeah. in terms of his stuff. I feel like it was received pretty well. Have you been uh, talked to more? Have you been seen around town? Have people been like, hey, I remember you from the show? Yeah, a lot of people talk to me about the show. Um, a lot of my teammates, some of them have mixed emotions about it. Mm. Um, but overall, I think it was great. I think it was a good thing for the, uh, the team to have and the university mm. to have. It definitely you know, put out an understanding of what we go through in a sense, on a day-to-day basis. Was the mixed emotion part maybe actually allowing the access for people to judge? What, what do you think maybe some of the mixed stuff or what, what might be one or two cons maybe of allowing that kind of access? A lot of guys wish they would have shown more. Okay. You know, of what the we editing process. Go through. Yeah. yeah. They really like the editing process. Gotcha. Um, some guys feel like some guys should have been featured a little more. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, everybody's going to have their opinion at the end right. of the day. So it is what it is. You know, at the end of right. the day, we got to be thankful that we were even exactly. able to have a part of that opportunity. And now just me, myself, I can just share with you, I had a chance with some of my partners here at the network to be filming a TV show. And we kind of didn't get that sense in that we filmed for four hours with George Lopez. Okay. And so we go to a church in Detroit. Yep, we filmed with them, and it was for a Detroit Lions kind of breaking the curse. <laughs> this sign right here, this green sign that you see, got yeah. featured on that show. And we didn't know, but we filmed for four hours. And we're like, wow, they're going to maybe do like an hour, two hours thing on this. And in the end, it just equated to Four hours of filming equated to eight minutes of television. I, I and that. so, yeah, you learn that, oh, man, they cut out a lot and things like that. So it is a yeah. lot. It is in terms of it's not like radio where you keep a lot of content. Right. Television is just film a bunch of stuff and let's go. And yeah, so exactly. could you imagine the stuff? They could make another series off of the stuff they cut. They really could. They can make a whole completely different TV show. Yeah, exactly. To. And tell a different story. But all in all, you were happy with the way you were portrayed. And uh, now you're ready to tackle your senior year and things like that. Most definitely. People also want to know a little bit more than just what's going on on the field. Right now, there's a lot of talk about student athletes right. because that's what you are. You are also a student at the University of Michigan, and people have also, you know, kind of looked at, you know, they're supposed to be practicing 20 hours a week as well as other stuff. But what was it like balancing being a university student trying to get an education, especially at Michigan, as well as balancing, you know, the, the commitment that you got to make yeah. to be a world class athlete? It must be tough. Take us through what's, what's it like? You know, it is very difficult and it's interesting yeah. because when you're on the outside looking in, you know, you have a you have a certain perspective. You know, when I was in high school. You know, I see articles and, and newscasts about, you know, players complaining about not getting paid. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're getting a full rise scholarship. Be thankful you're getting that, you know, X, Y, Z. But now that I'm in it and I'm on the inside and I know everything that goes on, I have a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, we go through a lot on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis, on a month-to-month -month basis, year-to-year -year basis. You know, and it's very difficult, especially at a program like the University of Michigan. You know, you have so much academic requir requirements, football requirements. And you have to make both of those balance or else you'll drown on, on one side or the other. You know, if you're succeeding in football and you're, you're, you're vanishing, you know, your academics, then academics is going to slip. If you're starring in academics, then nine times out of ten, your football is going to slip. It's not until you find that balance that you're able to, you know, kind of relax and enjoy, you know, the process. You know, so it's definitely difficult because the classes at Michigan aren't easy. They're rigorous. You know, so that requires you to have study tables where you got to meet with your tutor and have help from your academic advisor. But then you also have meetings. You know, you have practice, treatment, workouts. So finding a balance between all of that and still trying to have a same mindset for yourself can be difficult. It can be definitely difficult. And so you said it takes a little bit of time to get into that rhythm right. of utilizing your time, understanding where you got to be and what you got to do and things like that. If there's someone that's an influencer or a decision maker listening and they know that Karan Higdon speaking and speaking from the heart, what do you think maybe is one or two easier solutions that could help you out specifically in terms of maybe making it a little bit easier? Is it maybe potentially looking at monetary or more time to do this or less time to do that? What what one or two things right away could help you out? I mean, it's, it's hard to say. You know, mm -hmm. like I graduated in two years, 10 months. You know, so I got it done and I handled it, you know, and mm -hmm. that was primarily from the preparation that I had in high school. Gotcha. And I was very good with time management. Okay. But not everybody has access to that type of resource. Gotcha. And everybody has a different situation. So it's really hard to judge, you know. For me, like I said, I'm done. So I can't really say what may have helped me or hindered me because I don't know. Maybe too much time would have been bad for me. But I do think that there should be stipulations to help, you know, the balance between the athlete and the, and the student. 
basically trying to make it a little bit more of a balance between actually calling it the student athlete Correct. and not athlete, athlete, then student Correct. as the third or fourth priority. Correct. And I think we can start with that as well because it's being talked about. Maybe the process of change is going to be slow, but as more and more athletes talk about it and share experiences like you have about what it's like to be a student athlete and the emphasis on student as well as the emphasis on athlete right. because a lot of times it's just about you, you know, what you do on the field and things like that. But we care about you as a student as well. Exactly. We want, and, and I'm glad. What was your degree in? Uh, marketing. Marketing. Good. And so you felt like, okay, good. I got a degree for a uh, degree in marketing from the University of Michigan. And uh, you got that in your back pocket and hopefully a chance to use it in, exactly. in the future. So now let's kick it to your junior year. Now that year was amazing. 2017, you did a lot of good things on that football field. You helped offensively. What's it like being a contributing, a solid contributing member to the University of Michigan in that running game? It was awesome. You know, I just felt like I was doing my job and really just waiting for my name to be called so I can show, you know, who I am, what I'm about, you know. Before that season, nobody was hollering about my name. No one was really worried about me as an athlete. You know, a lot of people were worried about a lot of other a lot of other players and expecting a lot of other players, you know, to have you know a higher contribution, and they did. You know, but for me, it was really just waiting for my my opportunity to showcase my skill set. You know, and I had that, so I was excited about that. Exactly. So, in your mind, what's the scouting report on Karan Higdon, running back? In what context? What should people know about you as a running back if they look at the sheet? Because obviously scouts in the pro game and things like that, right. analysts and things like that, what do you want them to know about you and your game as a running back? Yeah, no, I feel like I'm very balanced. You know, I can run past you, you know, so I obviously I have speed. You know, I feel like I'm very powerful, so I can run through you if need be. And I, I'm shifty, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, the break you down and take four or five steps type of back. I'm not that type of shifty. I'm more mm -hmm. of make a solid cut, get out of there and get up field. What one thing or two things do you want to improve upon going into your senior year? Yeah. What do you want to get better at? I want to get more spread out, you know, catch more balls, you know, okay. out of the backfield. And I definitely want to improve my, my pass pro. I think that's something that can always be improved as a runner. That's one of the hardest things to do in college football. Okay, and so you got an obviously intimate relationship with Jay Harbaugh. He's got to do the job, get you to do better pass protection. What's it like also working with your position coach? Yeah, no, it's really cool. He brings a different perspective considering he never played the position. So he's able to look at it, you know, from a film perspective and compare and contrast, you know, in comparison to guys that may be like me in the league or, you know, maybe like Chris in the league and really just, you know, alternate our games, you know, as effective as he can. Okay, now the big game, obviously, 2017 was the game versus Ohio State, yeah. and you guys got out to the 14 nothing lead. It was huge. You guys were playing well, but unfortunately, you know, the quarterback, Barrett, got hurt, and their backup came in and handled his business. What was that game like for you? Because that was a big game, and one where it might have been a little bit unusual. I want to get your perspective because, yeah. in essence, to be honest, a lot of people didn't think you guys were going to be in the game. Not at all. Yeah, exactly, all. and so you know that, you know, keeping it real and honest. A lot of people didn't think you were going to be in the game, right. but you guys came out there and you punched Ohio State in the mouth. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, they came back and handled their business. What was that game like? Because obviously the highs of highs, because now three years in, you know the emotion that that exactly. is maybe a little bit different than Michigan State. That's maybe of all time proportion. That game goes to the country in terms of Michigan, Ohio State. And you got a 14 nothing lead, but in the end it didn't work out and uh, Ohio State took care of their business. Yeah, it's stressful. You know, I think before the game, you know, we, we made it very clear. I feel like yeah. a lot of the leaders made it very clear, including myself, you know, that everything's going to come down to little mistakes. And that's exactly what it came down to, you know. We had different situations regardless if it was a drop interception or a missed ball or, you know, a missed run, whatever the case may be, you know, those little things add up. And at the time, you know, those caused a lot of momentum shifts. And when that happens, especially with a team like that, you know, it can be very difficult to, to climb that ladder back up. And that's what it was. You know, they capitalized on our mistakes and we couldn't capitalize. Have you enjoyed the bowl experiences for you going down there? Um, obviously, a couple of little skirmishes here and there versus the opponents and things like that. Some fun stuff happens, right. obviously, but mostly what's important is the practice time, the ability to hang with the fellas and bond and things like that. Have you enjoyed the bowl experiences for you? Can you I share have, any stories I from have. some uh, bowl appearances? Yeah, no, they're definitely awesome. I mean, they're back, the past three have been back home. So, mm -hmm. you know, I yep. get to spend time with my family, my family and friends. You know, they get to come up and watch me practice, come up and watch me play. And I obviously get to show the guys, you know, around, you know, my state and show them some things that I know and some places that I know and recommend some places. So it's really cool to be able to, you know, step on that platform and really be a tour guide about my state. <laughs> Were you at the bowling alley when it went down? I was at the bowling alley. Take us a little bit inside. Where's it just the guys and their egos getting a little bit too much? Because people looked at it. There was film, obviously, with yeah. the, this day and age and stuff like that. What was going on? Were you guys just chirping a little bit too much back and forth? Yeah, no, they, they, were, chir they were chirping pretty hard and, uh, you know, Obviously, you have two teams, two competitive teams in the same arena. You know, that's 
never really good, mm-hmm. especially when you're getting ready to play in the next few days. Exactly. And both teams are passionate, you know, so that's what it was. A bunch of guys just chirping off and, you know, they were able to calm it down and ask, de-escalate the situation and continue to go about our business. How's your bowling game? My bowling game is pretty decent. Good. You yeah, can throw? My, my grandfather was a professional bowler. Oh, was he? Yeah. Bless him. Good stuff. <laughs> and so you, you uh, throw the ball with a nice hook and uh, you pay attention to the lane. So I, I, that was an activity yeah. you probably were looking forward to as yeah, well. Yeah, I was. I was. Awesome. So that's one thing that maybe people didn't know is that your bowling game is tight and that family member was a professional bowler. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Good stuff. That's awesome to hear. Uh, how many times uh, have you been bowling maybe in the last couple months? Three, four. Good, good. It's a fun activity, good stuff, and yeah. uh, an opportunity just to kind of hang out. Kind of hang it, out it, and relax. I really do believe bowling is underrated. It is. It, it very is. And if you're competitive, you know, it's definitely yeah. good for you. Now, 2017 is in the rearview mirror. Now you got a big season ahead because there's a lot of expectations, not only on you, the squad, and things like that. A little bit of influx with the quarterback position. A lot of people got eyes on Jim Harbaugh and what he's doing. Can you talk about your expectations now? 2018 season as well as the pressure how much are you feeling going into this season me no, yeah i don't feel any good because you know, at the end of the day i'm not doing it for anybody else but myself okay you know and, and for the better of my team my teammates my family um so really a lot of people are going to say things you know a lot of people set expectations for for me but i can't follow their expectations i have to follow my own you know because if i start doing it for other people then i lose track Do you feel Um, like the university does a good job of protecting you guys from the noise? Because in this day and age, man, it's 24 hours on Twitter, on sports talk radio, on the newspaper. You can, you know, if you peeked into it, you could hear some things that maybe not so nice. But do you feel like uh, you personally and the university does a good job to say, look, if you want to kind of avoid the noise, you don't really have to go down that road of knowing what people are saying. I think we're all grown men, so we all know. You know, we you have a choice to be on social media or not. I choose not to. So by me choosing not to be on social media, I necessarily, it never gets to me, you know, regardless if it's guys in my corner or ladies in my corner or guys out of my corner or ladies out of my corner. It doesn't get to me. Would that be a recommendation maybe to make it a little easier for college athletes these days? I most definitely would. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've done just fine without it. Um, but as far as the season goes, you know, I have a lot of high expectations for myself. So mine may even be high, higher than the haters. Exactly. Good. <laughs> what are your expectations yeah. for you personally? Personally, you know, I want to be the best back. Mm-hmm. You know, I came back for a reason. You mm-hmm. know, I could have forgone my my senior season, but I came back for a reason. I want to be the best back. Exactly. You know, I want to be in the Heisman talk. I want to win the Heisman. Awesome. I want to win, you know, the best running back award. I want to go first round. You know, I want to lead my team to a national championship, a Big Ten championship. I need some rings. I want to walk out with some rings, and I want my boys to have some rings. So in order to do that, I got to be at the top of my game, at my best game, and I got to push them to be at the top of their game in their best game. Okay, and so if it's them playing or not playing. Now, in terms of a leadership role, do you feel like as the years have progressed, because many people are talking about you with your expectations as well as, you know what, on that offense, becoming a real big-time leader to help the Michigan Wolverines meet their goals. How are you feeling about embracing that leadership role and what that might look like in a big-time football season? I feel like it's natural for me, and uh, I'm looking forward. You know, I want to be team captain or offensive captain this year. And uh, a lot of guys look up to me, and they expect that from me as well. So it's always great when you have your teammate support because you know it's a team. You know, and at Michigan, you obviously know it's about the team, the team, the team. So having that support of my teammates, my coaches, you know, is definitely, definitely prevalent. And nope. uh, I'm excited for it. Okay, and so you got September 1st circled, Notre Dame under the lights. Yeah. It's a big-time first game. Everyone's excited for it. It you, is. You got it circled? Oh, What are your sure. thoughts about starting the season? For me, I personally think that it's the start of my journey. Mm-hmm. You know, one or two things can happen. I can go out there and I can have an average game. I can go out there and do what I need to do and handle my business and put myself in the talks that I need to be in mm-hmm. as far as Heisman talks and best running back talks. So you set your goals really high. Yeah, for sure. You got to. Exactly. If not, then why are you doing it? You're wasting your time. You set those goals really high. And then also then, are you starting to peek at uh, the big time prize, joining uh, maybe a National Football League team? Uh, nah, I kind of keep that in my back pocket. Really, because I need to focus on this and what mm-hmm. I have to do. You know, at first, I don't want to jump the gun and start thinking, you know, ahead ahead of schedule. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if I handle my business, you know, then that'll be on the table. And then that'll be on the table. Everyone is excited to see what this program can do this year. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about maybe some of your own personal activities. What do you do outside of football that makes you tick? What do you like to do for fun and relax? Yeah, I like to hang out with my family. Uh-huh. I like to go, you know, to the park, maybe do some walks. I like mm-hmm. to play basketball. I like to bowl. Mm-hmm. I'm a big kid, so I like to go to arcades. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can catch me at Dave and Buster's, CJ Barrymore's, mm-hmm. you know, Rev and Roll. 
mm-hmm. often, you know, in our case. Yeah, so, yeah, so for many people that don't know, you are an East Sider here. Our office here is in Sterling Heights. So yeah. you like being part, you like uh, hanging out now here in the East Side. I do. It's a good town, right? Good it's side. different, man. It's, yeah. it's very different, calm, cool, and collective. A lot of Yeah, it is calm, cool, collective. Kind of, is it a little bit similar to Sarasota or a little bit different? Uh, Yeah. Parts of Sarasota. Okay. You go downtown Sarasota is similar. Okay. So it seems like you like to have a lot of fun, hang out with the crew, have a good time. Yeah. And things like that. Just enjoy, you know, being a human being. Yeah. Not always being a football player or, or a student. Exactly. What's the last movie you went to see? Uh, the last movie I went to see was, jeez, I don't remember. I, 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 you can catch me on Netflix a lot. Oh, uh, Netflix. <laughs> Very good. That's your, go, that's your go-to media. What are you, what's the last thing you binge watch besides All In? Um, so b- besides All In, Grey's Anatomy. I like Grey's Anatomy a lot. A lot of people like that, huh? Yeah. You caught up? Are you caught up knowing with all the people who've been passing? Away? I have not. Oh, know, okay. I, I, I recently started Grey's Anatomy a couple of months ago. I found out about it, and I've been binge watching it like crazy. So I watch that Law and Order. I watch that First Forty Eight. You know those type of shows. Okay, good. So you like to hang out, have a good time, things like that. Yeah. Another thing that people always kind of wonder is too is that you know what when people know that you're an athlete playing at Michigan, things like that, is it kind of hard to decipher who's being real with you and who's just maybe potentially maybe just getting to talk to you just to maybe uh, gain some gain something from right. you? Are you able to kind of know who's being real and who's being fake? And have you had to approach that at all? Yeah, no, I, I feel like you know I'm I'm very good at you know sniffing that out. Okay, but good. I'm a personal believer. You know, you put yourself in those situations. You know, if you're the type of player that's always promoting your platform and who you are as an athlete, then you attract those type of people. That, mm-hmm. Those type of people that are only attracted to, you know, mm-hmm. your platform. Okay. But if you're just being you and really, you know, that's just an added addition or accolade to your to your self-value and you're just being your genuine self, then you're going to attract people that are genuinely interested about you and want to know you. You know, like you're watching me right now. I don't have one piece of Michigan gear on. Gotcha. You know, so you look at me, if you've never seen my face outside of a helmet, you would never know I played. You gotcha. may assume I play a sport, but you would, ne- you would never know unless I told you. For those that don't know, you do spend your time uh, in between seasons on the east side here in Michigan. Tell us, for those that don't, who are not enrolled in Ann Arbor, what's the town like? What is it like kind of rolling around Ann Arbor, doing things in between, you know, your obligations and stuff like that? What's the town of Ann Arbor like? Yeah, it's awesome. It's very historical. You know, people are very liberal, um, intertwined. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot of things to get into, you know, social life, individual, you know, nature, um, sightseeing. You can do a variety of different things in Ann Arbor. So it's really cool. Which, let's say, you know, you're done with school, you've done uh, your prep for the test and things like that, and then you were done, you know, film study, stuff like that, working out. What kind of things could, could people have caught you doing uh, in your time in Ann Arbor? Probably walking around in the Arb. You know, mm-hmm. I, like, I like nature a lot, so I'll go sit on some of the bridges and just, you know, watch the water flow and, you know, maybe skip some rocks, you know, just have some time to, you know, clear my mind and think to myself. Okay, now let's talk some ball in terms of the NFL. Who do you think is the best running back right now, you know, patrolling the sidelines in the National Football League? <laughs> Who are the guys that you go right now when that uh, Sunday hits and, it's, and your, your Saturday's done, you're ready to turn on, watch some NFL football with the family? Who are you looking forward to seeing uh, this year in 2018? You know, there's so many guys that are great at a variety of different things, so it's really hard to say, you know, who's the best running back. Mm-hmm. You know, but I like guys like Devontae Freeman. Devontae Freeman is that guy. I, I, I love watching him. Um, I watched him in college, and uh, I continue to watch him as he's in the league, you know, and it's selling the way he does. I like uh, Todd Gurley. Mm-hmm. Todd Gurley is a GOAT. You know, yeah. I, I like him a lot, and I like his running style, and I like the way he, he gets after it. Um, so those are really two guys that I, I firmly watch a lot. Yeah, and have you seen what the Rams have done in the offseason? They've loaded up. <laughs> they they have, picked up Indomitian Sue. The pressure's on them now. Yeah. They got the offensive coach. He's ready to handle business. They've turned it around there with the L.A. Rams, and I think you know people are definitely interested to see, like, is this team you know going to be gelled together? That's obviously the first big question is, can that team gel quick, and yeah. can they do some things because they loaded up? Yeah, no, they have. Man. And I'm also looking for my boy Marlon Mack you know, to, okay. to take the starting spot with the Colts this year. So mm-hmm. I'm proud of him, man. Looking forward to that. Good. So do you watch a lot of uh, NFL football, you know, after, you know, after a tough Saturday game? I, I do. You mm-hmm. know, I do. If that's what I want to be in my future, you know, yeah. I got I to gotta watch it and I got to maintain it. And around town, you get a sense of how passionate when you go to Ann Arbor and the big house has 100,000 people. Fans in Michigan love their teams and stuff like that. You peeking a little bit to the lines and their new coach, and uh, now have, they got the running back. <laughs> okay, people want to know, okay, you're eyeing it, you're seeing. Auburn, he did some things, Carry on Johnson. Yeah, and yeah. people here in Detroit, that's why I think they gravitate towards you and Chris right. on the Wolverines, is that we want to see running backs do their business, handle their business. You do. The Lions haven't had a 100-yard rusher since the, the, to be honest, Karan, we haven't had a 100-yard rusher 
on the Detroit Lions since this podcast started back in 2013. You That's believe that? crazy, man. Can you imagine That's that? Crazy. Can you wrap your mind around it? We just need one 100-yard <laughs> rusher, and they went and drafted Carry on yeah, Johnson man. to handle his business. And, uh, man, it's just tough, too, because there's a lot of moving parts with an offensive line. Yeah. But, come on, 100-yard rusher? We kind of the Lions need some help. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, hey. You pick in a little bit on Sundays here and locally? Listen, man, hey. You know, I'm right here in Michigan. So That's right. Hey, it's, at the end of the day, it's in their hands. They, they, they the ones with the pick. They're the ones with the picks. <laughs> but I wouldn't be opposed to it. That's awesome. That's good stuff. Um, um, do you also do, I think you said that you also have an all-star 7-7 seven and seven team that you went and checked out in Florida and handled. I do. What's it like doing stuff in the community and doing stuff, uh, camps and things like that? Do you run them uh, locally or uh, back at home in uh, Sarasota? Yeah, man, it's awesome. You know, I run them here and I run them back home. Um, I'm, I'm in the process of, you know, um, planning out a camp to do maybe in July. Um, down here on the east side. Okay. So I'll make sure I get you that information so you can tell the viewers about it. Exactly. Have the kids come out, you know, and I'll do like a little sign of day, take pictures with the kids. But the 707 thing is cool. We're going to be playing a tournament June 16th and 17th down in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and the team's called Who Next? And really it's just the elite athletes at the area. And we're looking forward, you know, to put them on a platform where they can compete, showcase their skills, and see some different talents so they know what they're going against once they get into high school. Now, before we let you go, we do kind of a series of questions just to see um, what you think about it. So are you a Pepsi guy or a Coke guy? Ooh, Coke. No doubt about it. Why? Me personally, I think it's a little better. Yeah. Um, but I do like Pepsi as well. My grandmother was a huge Pepsi fan. Okay. Um, but I, I personally like Coke. Okay. Your honest opinion, because it's, one, it's a sports question that people are talking about, and we'll get to that one in a second. But Barry Sanders or Emmett, uh, Emmett Smith, who is the best running back <laughs> of those two? Because those are two elite. Those are two elite guys. Listen, uh, you can say whatever, hey, but that's the question that everybody that sits in that chair has got to ask. Uh, listen, that's that's got to answer. Barry that's Sanders, fair. Emmett Smith, man. That's fair. I love Barry, but hey. Deuce Deuce got the number, so I got to go with Emmett Smith. Yeah, Emmett <laughs> Smith was for real, man. He was. He was a guy that could uh, hit the holes, and he had a storied career and things like that. Barry is an interesting cat as a running back when you watch yes. him on film in that there's a skill in terms of being elusiveness and things like that. But to be honest, don't you think if Barry was running behind that line, he maybe would have had maybe 10,000 more yards than Emmett Smith? I definitely agree with that. Okay. But the fact is he didn't, so I got to give it to Emmett Smith. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. It's okay. We can respect that. And obviously we got to ask, Jordan or LeBron? Oh, uh, man. You know, I was just having this conversation. You know, I love LeBron. I'm a huge LeBron fan. You know, diehard LeBron fan. But Jordan is just a different creature. When the game's on the line, Jordan has that ball in his hand. Everybody mm-hmm. in the world knows Jordan has the ball in his hand. And you just knew that, you know as what? As much as I love LeBron, you don't know if he's going to pass it or shoot it. Exactly. And the thing is with that conversation, sometimes people want to you know, analyze numbers to death. And I just say, look, just watch the film. Yeah. I mean, when it was crunch time, you said, give the ball to Jordan and we are okay. It's done. Yeah. Right now with LeBron, he's a little bit more of a facilitator. And sometimes with his game, I think that sometimes he defers a little bit too much. No, and pe- sure. people look at that and go, man, you know what? There are games you can take over versus Sixers, but you also got to do it versus the Celtics when it's you. Nah, for sure. You and know, Jordan could do it. LeBron is a freakish athlete. You know, he is incredible and, and definitely one of my favorite athletes of all time. But, you know, like you said, you know, statistics and things really don't really matter. You know, especially me as a college athlete, I see it all the time. You know, I see a lot of guys that I personally feel like I'm better than them, you know, but their statistics are a lot better than mine, maybe because they have a better O-line, if some people may say, or maybe they play against sorrier teams, people may say. You know, it's a lot of variables that you can throw in, you know, and you can say LeBron plays in a different area, Jordan plays in a different area, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, like you said, it's about the film. Exactly. Jordan, crunch time. You know what's about to go down. LeBron, sometimes you do. You know, he's he, he's definitely one of a kind. But overall, facts is facts. And I think Jordan has them. Yep, you're working out. You, you need to get your workout in. You need to get your stuff in. Who's in the headphones when you're working out if you listen? And <laughs> who is killing the game right now? Who's the best hip-hop artist in the game right now? Uh, uh, well, when I'm working out, Maroon 5 is definitely playing. Oh, Maroon 5, good Shout stuff. Shout out to Adam Levine. Man. Yeah, that's, good stuff. That's my guy. I like Adam Levine. Um, but as far as the hip hop artists, um, man, I listen to a variety of different artists, so I can't specifically say one. Okay, who's in the uh, let's say top ten? Who's top ten? Who are some guys that you would say, okay, you know what, Doc, you got to put in in your uh, iPhone? Yeah, so uh, I definitely listen to NBA YoungBoy. I like Future. Um, I like Migos. Migos is definitely in there. I like Gucci Man. Mm-hmm. He's definitely in there. Rich Homie Quan is in there. Rich Homie Quan, yep. yeah. Rich Homie be doing his thing. Yep. Um, 
Um, Kodak of Vienna, you know, okay. got to represent the hometown, home mm-hmm. city. Meek Mill, Meek Mill is definitely in there. Did I say Young Thug? Young Thug is in there. Outside of that, okay, really not no. too many. Other, That's good. I'll listen back and uh, we'll listen. I definitely know from uh, the Spartan side, uh, Rich Homie Kwan. So yeah. we all know that. <laughs> okay, so then um, to wrap this up, we've had the opportunity, the blessing to spend some time with Karan Higdon, and he's a special athlete. He's going to do some big things, and even more important than that, he's a kind person. You can tell he lives by his word, and when he gives you his word, you know he's going to deliver. And I, I really appreciate you coming in. No Most problem, wouldn't no. just off of just a recommendation from a from a close friend, and uh, it's really awesome that you took the time to spend but i also want to know okay let's say um we're looking back and we have this conversation maybe 20 years from now what do you want people to say about karan higdon what do you want your life to be about going forward maybe even after a professional career i definitely want them to know that it's more than football Mm -hmm. you know just for me football is just an asset for me and just a platform that i was able to be blessed with but there's more to me than just that you know football is just a stepping stone that i was able to use to you know make a life for my family my my future you know so that's something I would want everybody to know. Exactly, and I think that's really key, and that's why we get a chance to spend uh, some time uh, with these great athletes is that, you know what, yes, they can do great things on the field. They have great athletic prowess, but there's more behind them. Uh, You are hopefully going to utilize that marketing degree to do great things as well, and uh, hopefully this 2018 season you stay healthy. Oh, I have to ask, obviously. It was one of the questions that uh, obviously came through on Twitter, on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast. How excited is the squad about potentially the addition of Shea Patterson uh, behind center? Everybody's just... When I asked, hey, Karan Higdon's here, they want to know, what are, what's the crew thinking about Shea Patterson? Yeah, they're very pumped up. They're, they're very happy. You know, I'm very happy that we got him. He's a great addition, but I will say we have a stout quarterback competition going on, a, a very stout. You know, Shea coming, Joe Milton coming in has definitely elevated the guys that have been there. It's elevated their game to a whole nother level. So they're competing very hard right now. So shouts out to each and every one of them. You know, I'm proud of those guys. Um, and also shout out to my O-line. Mm-hmm. Love you boys and uh, can't, be, can't wait to work with you guys. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. One more question here from Twitter on our Twitter page. We had a huge response, and I thank everybody, and I thank you for allowing us to uh, take questions as well. They want to know who are you close with on the squad, who do you maybe hang out with from the, uh, from the offense or the defense? Yeah, um, I'm close with a variety of guys. I try and keep it, you know, a, a firm balance between each and every one of them um, because each and every one of them are important to me. We all are a team. You know, I value the walk-ons just as much as I value the scholarship guys. So I really try and have an equal relationship with each and every one of them because at the end of the day, you know, year year in and year out, you know, guys separate, guys leave. So you got to kind of keep it at a, at a firm level. That way you're not getting too emotionally into it. Karan Higdon, running back, University of Michigan. He'll be in a great competition with Chris Evans for the number one spot. I think he's going to have a good leg up, a good solid chance to repeat what he did in 2017. And I'm, I wish you, everybody here you know, at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, wishes you a great season. Stay healthy, be strong, and do some great things on the field, as well as continue to grow um, outside of the game as well. We appreciate it, and we know you're going to do some big things. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks a lot, Karan. You've been listening to the one-on-one podcast. To support the other podcasts on the network, check out DetroitSportsPodcast.com. We greatly appreciate it. This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network.